Hello, welcome back to this ongoing presentation of International Plumbing Code Chapter 4, Fixtures, Faucets, and Fixture Fittings. And I've told you before, this is one of my favorite chapters because I love finish work. I have a question for you though. What is your favorite fixture? One of the great things about being a plumber is the variety. There are a lot of fixtures that we install and a lot of pipe work that we do just to install those fixtures. So we end up seeing a lot of variety in our work and I hope that's something that you enjoy and appreciate. Now in this chapter 4 we're going to go through those fixtures and faucets and we're going to examine where code and standards apply to each one. So. We'll start with 406, and in this presentation, we're gonna go through 412. There's enough in here that we're gonna still break this up a little bit as far as talking about each of these fixtures and the code requirements that apply. So let's get into 406. All right, 406 is about automatic clothes washers. 406.1, we look at the water connection. 406.2, we look at the waste connection. Those are the two main plumbing connections that we have to any washing machine. Now, as far as the water connection, you know we hook them up with hoses. Generally, we'll have a washer box or some other valves that they can connect to. Those hoses hook onto the back. It's a good idea to replace those hoses every so often because they just wear out, and that's a major source for leaks. But all that aside, when we hook up the water to a washing machine, that washing machine has to have an air gap built in. And we've talked about the air gap and how that protects our potable water against backflow from drainage. We wouldn't want our water to be contaminated by anything in that washing machine. So this air gap is actually built into the machine and that is where the water flows into the barrel that washes the clothes, there's actually a gap inside of there built in. That's not even something you have to do, but it is a code requirement. 406.2, we look at the waste connection the waste for a washing machine has to have an air break. Now with an air break, that pipe that comes from the washing machine can actually be below the flood level rim of the receptacle or the stand pipe, meaning you have the drain in the wall and you just stuff the hose down inside. It is not a direct connection because if the drain in the wall backs up, it's gonna overflow and it's not gonna push into the washing machine. That's a good thing. We don't want waste from the drainage coming into our washing machine either where we wash our clothes. Now, one more important thing about washing machines is that when we size that drain, when we're running a drain from a washing machine, it has to be a two inch pipe and wherever it connects to the next branch or as it's going on down the drains, it needs to connect to a three inch pipe. This is for the purpose of suds. As wash water moves down the drain, it can be very sudsy, and those suds can actually restrict the flow of the drain, backing it up. And so code has come to now define that and say you have to have a larger drain as it connects downstream. So you're gonna have a two inch drain pipe, and then as that goes downstream, it needs to connect to a three inch pipe. 407 gives us information on bathtubs. First of all, 407.1 gives us a list of standards that would be approved for a bathtub, so any manufacturer has to meet those standards. 407.2 gives us the waste outlet, so that's the drain. It has to be at least one and a half inches, and code also requires that a bathtub has a stopper that will not leak, so it can hold water in the tub. 407.3 goes over the glazing and basically just gives us standards for the finish of that fixture. And also 407.4 gives us standards for the enclosure of that fixture. One interesting note on bathtubs in 407.2, bathtubs are no longer required to have an overflow outlet on the tub. 
Now in the past, and on many tubs, there is an overflow, but it's actually not a requirement anymore. Part of that has to do with all these freestanding tubs that have been created. And if you ever see the overflow pipe, assuming there is one on the freestanding tub, uh, there's sometimes it's just a little bit of a slit or whatever. There's generally not enough opening to be able to take that volume of water from the faucet. Now a faucet on a freestanding tub is usually going to deliver a higher volume of water than any other faucets because you're trying to fill this big tub fast. And so you've got a fast flowing faucet and these little skimpy overflow openings and it just it's not even possible for it to take it down. So they've just removed that requirement and placed the responsibility on the user to say well if you're going to run a tub you should be watching to make sure that it doesn't overflow. In 408 we learn about bidets and the requirements for that. Now if you're anything like me starting out into plumbing I was like uh, what's a bidet? Because we don't see those very often around here and that's kind of a disadvantage to Americans because a bidet is something that you can use to wash after you have used the toilet and in countries in Europe they're actually fairly common. The reason we don't have very many of them here is because for many years they were a separate fixture so you'd have your toilet in the bathroom and then another porcelain fixture you get off the toilet and go sit on the bidet and it's going to wash you clean which is great except that that's kind of a luxury item and most Americans aren't willing to pay for an extra fixture in their bathroom and the extra space that that would require. However, in recent years the toilet seat bidet has become increasingly popular. You may have seen these. These are even high-tech seats where the seat is heated and it can blow you dry and it can spray you in 10 different ways with different temperatures of water. It even has a remote control. So bidets are becoming more common in that situation for those of us in the United States. But the requirements of course are 408.1. These would have to meet certain standards and be approved. 408.2, there is a water connection to this because it will use water to wash you clean. And that water connection needs to have an air gap for the protection of our potable water. And 408.3 says the bidet water temperature needs to be a maximum of 110 degrees. Now it's nice to have comfortable warm water so that you're not washing yourself with extremely cold water. But at the same time if it were incredibly hot water, say 120 degrees or more, and you're washing yourself with that, you're going to end up with some pretty severe scalds in some very uncomfortable places. So that's what we have on bidets. In 409 we learn about dishwashing machines and the requirement for those standards and approvals in 409.1. 409.2 states that the water connection has to be through an air gap or a backflow preventer and that again like the washing machine is built into the dishwasher there's an air gap where water is delivered inside of that unit. Now the waste connection can be either an air gap or an air break and we go into a lot more detail for the waste connection in chapter 8 when we look at indirect waste. All right, let's talk about drinking fountains for a minute. We have 410 that covers this subject. 410.1 has the approvals and standards that drinking fountains would have to meet. 410.2 says that if there are less than 15 people in an occupancy that the drinking fountain is not required. 410.3 gives us the minimum number of drinking fountains when they are required. And it says that if in an occupancy that we looked at earlier in this chapter, there is a requirement for one drinking fountain, then we have to be fair to both the people who are in the wheelchair or handicap situation and who would be able to use a drinking fountain standing up. So in other words, you have to have one for each. Let's examine this illustration really quickly. So if you have a requirement for one drinking fountain in a building, then as I stated, you have to have one for high and low. This can be a combined high and low unit and that's often how they are purchased or you can have separate drinking fountains, one that's high and one that's low to meet the needs of both people. Now if you have a requirement for two drinking fountains then you can again have a high low the combination and yet that meets the requirement for the two drinking fountains 
or you could have them separated one high and one low at different locations in the building. If you have a requirement for more than two drinking fountains, like we have here, they require three, then you can have the high-low unit, that's a combination, it counts for two, and you can have one at a higher elevation somewhere else, or you can separate all three and have one that's low and one that's high, and one that's high or low. So you can see how, depending on the number required, you have a variety of situations of how those can be installed or set up, but at a minimum, if one is required, then you have to have two, one at each elevation. 410.4 states that when it comes to drinking fountains, a certain amount of those drinking fountains can be substituted for water dispensers or bottle fillers, but you can only substitute up to 50% of the required drinking fountains for a bottle filler, and that has to be connected to potable water. This can't be like a, a bottle dispenser where Coligan or someone brings water in and it's bottled. No, this has to be an actual potable water connection that they can fill a bottle from. 410.5 says that a drinking fountain is not to be installed in a public restroom. And you'll notice that when you use the restroom, you go out and the drinking fountain is outside of the restroom. That's good and that's intentional because we don't want to be drinking from the same place that other less sanitary things are happening. In 411, we examine emergency showers and eyewash stations. Once again, they have to meet certain approvals in 411.1. 411.2 says there's actually not a waste requirement, so there's no drain connection for an eyewash station required. And 411.3 says if water is supplied, and if it's warm water, then it has to be tempered down you can imagine how that would be if you get chemicals in your eye and you're frantically trying to wash it out at an eye wash station and it hits you with 120 degree water and it scalds your eyes and on top of it. No, we can't have that happening. So tempered water so that it can wash out without increasing pain and discomfort and injury. As we look at section 412, it goes over faucets and fixture fittings and this is kind of a catch-all for different types of faucets and valves that apply to finish and fixtures. So we have 412.1 where a certain approvals are required for standards that those must meet. 412.2 talks about hand showers and again gives standards and approvals that those would need to meet. Also stating that backflow prevention is required on those handheld showers. 412.3 goes over individual showers and spells out the requirement for a pressure balance. This makes it so that if you get a decrease in pressure in the cold side, it also decreases the hot side within the valve so that you don't get burned. That's how it used to be in the 1980s, but things are better now and these valves are designed to eliminate that problem. Also, individual showers should have a maximum delivery temperature of 120 degrees so that people don't get burned in the shower. 412.4 goes over multiple or gang showers. This is the gym locker type shower where it's just a tower with all kinds of shower heads around it, but uh, it gives out some standards and it states that the maximum temperature delivered from a multiple or gang shower should be 120 degrees. You, you're noticing a pattern here, 120 degrees. That is because anything more than 120 degrees results in very fast scalding. You can be burned in 120, but it takes a while but anything more than that and it increases your scalding and the, the level of burns happens so much faster. So 120 is the borderline of safe. Okay, 412.5, bathtub and whirlpool, those bathtub valves, the fill valves have to be once again maximum 120. Now if we have water that in our hot water side is higher than 120, we can temper it down. You can see in this slide there is a mixing valve. You bring the hot and the cold together. You mix it down to 120 or less and then you deliver it over to the tub or shower or whatever fixture so that it is a safe temperature. 412.6 gives some standards for hose connection outlets. 412.7 gives information about temperature actuated flow reduction devices for individual fixture fittings. Hey, say that 10 times fast. What is that? Oh, well, let me explain. It's particular to fixtures like showers, shower heads. 
where if the water comes through at 120 degrees or more, there's a device inside of there that actually shuts it off. It would close off the flow to the shower head just because the temperature is too hot. Now that could save scalding, it really could. Now obviously the intention for that is to save people from being scalded by just having a device that can stop hot water. And 412.8 talks about transfer valve. A transfer valve is a valve where you can send water from one location to another. A good example is like a bathtub where maybe it's a, it has a filler but it also has a sprayer and you have a valve that transfers back and forth. 412.8 gives us information about that and the standards that that would need to meet. 412.9 gives us standards for these water closet personal hygiene devices and that's another fancy way of saying a toilet seat bidet. Uh, these high-tech things that we talked about earlier but it gives the standards that those would need to meet. And 412.10 gives us information about head shampoo sink faucets. Once again, limiting the temperature to 120 because we don't want to scald anyone on their scalp. And finally, 412.11 gives information about pre-rinse spray valves in commercial food service and some standards for that. All right, so in this presentation, we have covered from 406 to 412 talking specifically about fixtures and appliances and the requirements for those. Question for you though, what is the maximum temperature that should be delivered to any fixture? You got it, it's 120. I'm glad you remember that. Join me next time and we will finally finish chapter four. We will cover from section 413 to 426 looking at the rest of the fixtures, and I will see you then.